Here we go. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers for uh, the invitation to share of some of our work here uh, with you at the, uh, at the focus meeting. And um, I tried to focus a little bit more on the future. I'm not going to predict the outcomes of uh, the upcoming matches, but I'd like to talk to you a little bit about 3D printing. And 3D printing, as you all know, is a, is a rising field, and we see it all around us. And it actually um, is changing the way how we perceive manufacturing. What you can now do is you can just have your own idea and, and draw that in a, a 3D uh, software program. And even the standard um, Photoshop, the new versions, do have that 3D capability. And then you can either upload that and, and pick, a, pick a material, um, send it to a company that can print it for you, or you just print it at home. In this sense, um, 3D printing can actually bypass the whole uh, traditional supply chain. So you go directly from your bright idea to the product in your hands. Um, of course, in different settings, that manufacturing chain or that supply chain will, will, will be different, and in some cases there will be more control required, like in the medical field. But it's also called the third revolution, the third industrial revolution, and that's because it's now can, it can now compete. It can compete with injection molding uh, technologies, which are the standard way of producing small uh, parts at high quantities. And there are now new printers that, that, that can do this at a very high speed. But it will also impact on our daily lives. Maybe the next time you travel to the ICRS meeting, um, according to Airbus, you will have a completely different experience because we can create structures that we could not create before in architectures or with strengths that we could not create before. And as you might know as well, this technology finds its way to personalized medicine as well. So we can create structures, implants, plastic implants. And this is an example of our clinic where we recently implanted a 3D printed skull in one of our patients. Um, if we look at 3D printing and how that's being positioned within orthopedics, I'd like to look at the uh, hype cycle as being um, uh, proposed by the, the company of Gardner. Each product runs through this hype cycle, and it goes with expectations over time. And interestingly, if we look at orthopedics, it's already quite mature 3D printing in our field. And we know we have these um, uh, saw and drill guides. There is already 3D printed metal implants uh, that, that are being used. But if you then look a bit further backwards at the beginning of the slope, there's also the field of bioprinting. That's something where we're active in. So it's the printing of living uh, cells and creating three-dimensional structures. Well, my future outlook, uh, besides that Holland will beat Brazil, um, is that um, this technology might provide um, the opportunity to create larger constructs with organized tissues that might even be able to replace larger pieces of tissue uh, in the human in the future. And that would have, applying this technology, would have some specific advantages. You can address the specific tissue organization. So even specific tissue types, but specific cells or specific materials at different locations. It can be patient-specific. You can address the local anatomy or the, or the shape of the defect. And instead of replacing part of the joint, you might have a reparative or even a regenerative approach. I'd like to share some, um, some, some recent developments there. Uh, the, group of, the group of De Lima um, demonstrated recently that if you take an uh, osteochondral plug, <coughs> and you create a defect in there, they just used a, a general inkjet printer and, and actually printed layered constructs into these defects um, as a way of how cells can survive this process. Interestingly, if you look at uh, the cells, the curing of the gel, so the gelation, is a very important aspect because cells may settle if you don't do it fast enough in these different layers. Uh, another group that's been really active in this field is the group of Larry Bonassar. Um, and they have been working also on a um, system where they have a condyle and they actually scan the defect and then fill it up with a cell-based hydrogel. And this way you could think of the first steps towards in situ bioprinting. Complete joints or larger constructs have actually not been produced yet, but there are some examples of groups that have worked on printing larger scaffolds, just cell-free scaffolds and either put cells on top or put bioactives on top. There's an example from uh, the group in Twente where um, they created rabbit joints, so uh, the femur and the tibia, based on a 3D printing approach. Well, although these constructs were functional, 
uh, histology was still poor. And more recently, and we saw that at one of our ICRS meetings, the group of Jeremy Mao created constructs uh, to replace part of the shoulder joint in rabbits. Um, and based on imaging technology, they then created fitting constructs with a stem. And if they added TGF beta 3 to these constructs in a collagen hydrogel, they actually saw improved cartilage formation in the sense of histological staining and amount of cells uh, and amount of tissue. But this is still. 3D printing. So, taking the next step towards 3D bioprinting, what are we facing? Well, we're facing some major challenges, and of course, we first faced the challenge of Costa Rica, but that's for uh, this weekend. Um, we also face the fact that there is a lot of uh, media attention. There's a lot of hype around this 3D printing, and of course, people have seen the 3D printed skull, and we get a lot of questions. Can you know, also print a heart next week? And of course, this is a completely different question. So from my point of view, it's our responsibility to also provide a realistic expectation. That's going to be the first challenge, to be realistic towards our patients. What can be done with this technology? And what are the um, uh, opportunities, but also what are the difficulties? Well, some of the difficulties regarding the uh, uh, specific creation of these grafts um, lays back into creating the correct cellular environment. So in this case, the bio-ink that we use with to print. And if you then think of taking the next step to creating a larger construct, there's mechanical stability involved, but also scale-up, nutrient limitation. This needs to be remodeled into a mature tissue that can actually take the whole function. And finally, there's also the translational aspects, the regulatory aspects, and, and do you go from two states, single states, etc. So let me tell you where we are now. We are focusing on, on 3D printing of cartilage and osteochondral uh, constructs to fill focal <coughs> defects. And um, the concept of that is that we look at the cartilage as a layered structure with different types of cells, and we took out these cells and confirmed that these cells, if you, if you culture them, uh, you, you de-differentiate them, and you put them back into a hydrogel, they actually come back to the specific zonal phenotype. On the other hand, we also know from literature that if you put cells in a different environment, you can actually stimulate some of the specific threats of these different layers. So there's two approaches where you can either use different cells in different cartridges, or you can use different materials with the same sort of cells. This concept is now translated to a large European project with 15 different partners and even partners on the other side of the world, uh, where we, uh, through equine studies, uh, try to translate this to the equine clinic as a first step towards the human clinic. And the concept of that project is as follows, where we um, focus at chondral and osteochondral defects, so the cartilage and the underlying bone that can be imaged and then translated to a 3D file in the computer. And this can then be printed on a bioprinter. And we combine strong biomaterials, like thermoplastic materials, with bioinks. And bioinks are hydrogel-based, um, cell-containing uh, structures that can be uh, deposited in a layered fashion. And in this way, you can create a construct that more is like the real tissue, has more traits of the real tissue. Now, let's have a look at the, um, at the cellular environment and the bioink. Um, if you compare 3D printing, like the standard con conventional 3D printing, and compare that to the bioprinting, there's uh, some important differences. The most important difference is that the boundary conditions are completely changed. These conventional processes take high temperatures and often solvents in the, into their fabrication process. And that's something we cannot do when we would like to create living uh, organized structures. And therefore we turn to the bioinks or, or hydrogels, and we already know from the early work of Benya and, uh, and Guo for in alginates and, and, and agarose that, that of course hydrogels are an unsuitable environment for these cells. And we have the opportunity to include extracellular matrix components, I'll show you an example of that, um, peptide sequences or other uh, biologic cues to increase uh, the uh, eff efficacy of the cells that are embedded in these hydrogels. A system that we found suitable for this, uh, for this bioprinting is a gelatin-based system. It's gelatin metacrylate, which is uh, based on, on, on normal gelatin. It's denatured collagen. It's degradable. It's temperature-sensitive like normal collagen. 
uh, normal gelatin. But we added the metacrylated groups, so it's also photosensitive. So we can do a two-step uh, cross-linking gelation of our gels. To improve the gondogenic um, uh, feature of this material, we included um, hyaluronic acid, also with the metacrylated group, and we demonstrated that if you culture the cells for eight weeks in these, in these hydrogels, you see an increase in the expression of collagen type 2, of agarcan, and you see, uh, and that's also what you actually can confirm with your uh, uh, quantitative assays, and you see a decrease in the collagen type 1 expression. So that's going into the right direction for um, cartilage formation. If you would add another protoglycan, so gondotin sulfate, we do not see an added, uh, an added effect on, uh, on, on either gondotin sulfate alone or, or the combination of the two. But we do see an effect on the, uh, uh, on, on the cell morphology. So in the normal gel gelatin-based hydrogels, the cells are more stretched, or well, they're more rounded, gondotin-like in the uh, uh, in the hyaluronic acid containing hydrogels. But then, that's the cellular environment. But we also need to build with these structures. We need to make them layer by layer. We have to create a 3D architecture. And that's sort of posing a challenge. Um, you would like to have a shape that you can define and control. And you'd like to have also um, a, a, a material in which the cells thrive best. So these are often opposing requirements that you put onto your hydrogels. So traditional biofabrication uh, had to make concessions regarding these two materials and sit somewhere in the middle. And we're working on novel strategies to then create structures and provide that 3D environment for the cells. Let me give you an example. We look at, for instance, we take advantage of the rheology, the flow properties of these polymers. We do, um, we create a structure based on the thermosensitive uh, properties of the hydrogel and the shear thinning uh, properties. And then we do a secondary cross-linking where we really fix the structure, for instance, in this case with UV. Well, going back to that first structure, the, the hydrogel has a high viscosity, and all the hydrogel chains are cold within your, within your cartridge. If you then start pressing it out, the um, hydrogel change, the polymer chains will align, vis viscosity goes down, and therefore you can print, the material starts to flow. Um, once it comes out, it reorganizes and viscosity goes up, so you can maintain your structure. That's called the yield stress. Or the yield stress defines how well you can maintain it. And then you can do your secondary cross-linking of your structure. Um, here's an example how that would look. We just made cylindrical constructs before the secondary cross-linking. And if you take the plain gelma, that slowly just settles out and becomes a puddle. Um, if you include gel on, gel on gum, which is a food additive, it's uh, high viscosity, um, you can create and maintain that structure better over time before that secondary cross-linking. If you then tailor the salt concentration, you can even create a structure that you can maintain for a longer period of time, which is an advantage to create these structures with 3D bioprinting. However, the ionic strength here is only a tenth of normal physiological conditions, so we had to show that if you then um, uh, compensate for that, for instance, using manos, that the cells are still active. So now we have a structure, and we have a material that we can build these structures with, um, and we can create structures which are either solid, different shapes, porous, um, we can even create uh, transverse pores in these hydrogels, and, uh, which, is, uh, which is quite a challenge uh, if you work with specific hydrogels. And then combining this into structures that have either MSCs or chondrocytes, um, pre-differentiated or not, you can also create uh, osteochondral uh, structures. Um, even though the interference of these cells is something that needs to be looked at very carefully if, uh, if you do in vitro maturation of these constructs prior into implantation. Another obvious uh, challenge is the mechanical stability, and especially when these constructs become larger. If you have a material you can print with and layer by layer create nice structures, you can actually have something that is like a miniature joint. And using a, a support material that, that a little bit works as a mold, you can create um, these layered structures where there is uh, different types of cells in the different regions. Um, but still, this is inherently weak. If you would implant this, it would probably crush. And that's why we developed a, uh, 
uh, a fiber reinforcing approach, um, the combination of printing thermoplastic polymers with these hydrogels. So we can create um, organized structures or layer by layer or, or tubular um, that contain these, these stronger fibers as a sort of reinforced concrete. If you then also uh, adjust the polymer, so the hydrogel can actually covalently graft to these fibers, you can do uh, some experiments where we have these, these, these condolar struct, uh, structures being printed in a fitting um, a 3D printed graft. Um, and if we do cycles of, of creep and, and recovery, we can see if you have the covalent grafting, you see that these um, structures do fully recover. Now, the next step is how do the cells then perform? The, this is the control where you see the structure, the, 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 the PCL, the thermoplast fibers, the hydrogel in blue when you put no cells in there, and if you then put cells, you see the red staining for the proteoglycans. So these are uh, subcutaneous in vitro experiments, and we're now translating this, fi this fiber reinforced uh, uh, approach together with Daniel into an equine study where we then look at uh, the longer term functional outcomes. Looking at larger constructs, um, nutrient supply is also a very important aspect. And there's one thing I'd like to, to show, you, um, show you here as well. That's some nice work that comes from uh, Jennifer Lewis's group. They, they use different bio inks, but they also use this, this, an approach to create hollow vessels. How do they do that? They, they create here uh, printed structures with, uh, with, let's say, blue and, and, and green cells. And uh, using a thermosensitive material, they, they also print um, a vessel structure. Then you cast a hydrogel around it and you switch to another temperature so the red material dissolves. You can seed your open porous structure with, uh, with endothelial cells. So create an artificial vascular structure which you can possibly then create, uh, which helps you to create and supports that larger structure, the nutrient supply that you need. So to wrap this up, what's next? Um, I think that a full joint replacement or a regenerative approach uh, is something that's indeed a very future uh, perspective. Um, but uh, there is a lot of research going on regarding the development of the 3D tissue models. They, these can be used, of course, for, for biological research, like the small joint in a well, uh, left on the chip uh, approaches, but also for disease models. So patient-specific disease models or screening models for toxicity um, or, or drugs. I think if we control the maturation of these implants, these, these transplant or these constructs, as I have to call them, uh, well, we can we can move in the future towards uh, the application of tissue transplants. And if you look around in the literature and what's going on, I think cartilage and liver are the one, the two tissues where this this technology is furthest uh, developed. And um, well, never say never. We'll have to see what's next. Uh, I'd like to thank you for your. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much for this.